Hello and welcome to the Better Man Clinics, the podcast where we talk to actual experts to address the questions that men want answered, but are either too embarrassed to ask or simply don't know who to ask. Before we get started, I do want to caution that the conversations on this podcast are for informational purposes only. They don't represent a medical consultation, nor do they present medical advice to individuals. Rather, we hope that the podcast empowers men with the knowledge and confidence to address these issues with their healthcare providers. As with any medical or wellness issues, you should always consult with your healthcare provider before beginning any type of treatment or preventative intervention. With that being said, in this episode, we continue our discussion about testosterone replacement therapy. In a previous episode, we spoke to Dr. Amy Perlman about how men can determine whether testosterone therapy may be right for them. But what do you do after you decide that you want to proceed with testosterone therapy? What type of testosterone treatments should you try? Shots, creams, pellets, or even pills? What are the risks and benefits of each? How are the different treatment options administered? And what do you need to monitor and watch out for when receiving testosterone replacement? In order to help us answer these questions, we are fortunate to be joined by an expert in testosterone supplementation. Dr. Rachel Rubin is a board-certified urologist and sexual medicine specialist. She's an assistant clinical professor of urology at Georgetown University and works in private practice in Washington, D.C. She is one of only a handful of physicians that are fellowship trained in male and female sexual medicine. Dr. Rubin is a clinician, researcher, and vocal educator in the field of sexual medicine. She completed her medical and undergraduate training at Tufts University, her urology training at Georgetown University, and her fellowship training under Dr. Erwin Goldstein in San Diego. In addition to being education chair for the International Society for the Study of Women's Health, she also serves as associate editor for the journal Sexual Medicine Reviews. She was named a Washington top doctor for the past three years. And now I bring you our conversation with Dr. Rachel Rubin about navigating the different options for testosterone replacement therapy. Hello and welcome to Better Man Clinics. Today we're continuing our conversation about testosterone. As many of you guys remember, a few weeks ago, we had on Dr. Annie Perlman to talk about, is testosterone right for me? We talked about kind of the symptoms of low testosterone. If you guys remember feeling fatigue and that brain fog and sexual dysfunction, as well as understanding kind of which guys are right for testosterone and which guys probably should stay away from it. Today, we're taking that conversation one step further. What if you've decided to take testosterone? What does that even mean? What are the different options to, uh, to receive it? What is it like to be getting testosterone? What kind of symptoms are you gonna be feeling? What kind of potential side effects? And what is that day-to-day -day experience of being on testosterone supplementation? A lot of questions. And fortunately today, we have somebody to provide us with some great answers. We're fortunate to be joined by Dr. Rachel Rubin, who is not only a board certified urologist, but also a specialist in male sexual medicine. Dr. Rubin, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you for having me, and what an honor to follow Dr. Amy Perlman, who is uh, so wonderful, a good friend, and made me record a few videos with her recently after we went to the Sexual Medicine Society meeting together. So it's good timing that we're doing this together. That's right. Big shoes to fill, but I know you're, you're there for the job. You're going to do a great job. That's for sure. Your, your reputation precedes you. That, so we, we have every confidence. Well, happy um, to help. So let's get, let's get to it. Well, you know, actually, given your reputation, actually, what I'd like to do, what I love to do is, uh, before we even jump into testosterone, we'd love to learn a little bit about you, uh, because, you know, the guys want to know who they're getting this information from. Uh, and so it, rather than read off your resume, what I'd love to hear from you is kind of what inspired you to go into sexual medicine and kind of what drives you on a day-to-day -day basis to help guys get better over these type of problems. I love that question. So I'm a urologist um, and, and everyone else says, what is, what is a lady doing going into urology? Like, what are you thinking? And, <laughs> and, you know, I always say, and especially sexual medicine, there's, you know, only about less than 10% of women are practicing urologists and even fewer are in the sexual medicine world. And I am actually one of only a handful of people that's fellowship trained in sexual medicine, not just for men, but for women as well, which is really fun. Cause as I say, I can take care of any love triangle that comes into my <laughs> office, you know, whoever shows up, I can help whether it's, you know, men, women, 
women, both, whatever you got there. And right. so, you know, when a guy comes in with erectile dysfunction or a sexual problem, and often men are heterosexual, not always, of course, but if a heterosexual man comes in, who knows about it? Is it his golf buddies? Is it his bowling partners? Is it his brother? Not usually. It's actually usually his female partner. And so I believe men actually are inherently comfortable talking to women about these issues. And I believe female doctors have a little bit more of an emotional intelligence sometimes more than some of the male doctors who really listen, who spend, I mean, data shows we spend extra time with our patients and we really come at it from sort of a more empathetic uh, standpoint. Of course, not always. Of course, I have wonderful male colleagues. Uh, I believe that if you have a doctor who just gives a crap and really cares about these issues, they're going to be so much better than maybe a urologist who doesn't, you know, necessarily focus on sexual problems. Sure, absolutely. Well, that sounds fantastic, and I'm sure your patients are are lucky to have you. I, you know, I uh, I along with the countless others follow you on social media, and the passion you have for your craft is palpable, and for helping people is palpable. So again, you got some lucky guys who are coming to you for help, and we have some lucky listeners and viewers who will be able to take in your expertise. So um, with that said, like, as I mentioned, you know, we spoke to your colleague, Dr. Perlman, a few weeks ago about is testosterone right for me? Now, let's say I'm your patient and I'm coming in and you know what, I've decided to proceed with testosterone. Can you give us an understanding of what are the different options? Because, you know, our, uh, you know, the people think testosterone, but that comes in various flavors, if you will, or forms. Can you give a shed some light as to the different ways that testosterone can be administered in, in men? Yeah, we're very lucky for the male side of things. We have a lot of options for male testosterone, but it also means that sometimes you get too many options. Sometimes your insurance doesn't always agree with all of those mm -hmm. options. And a really big asterisk, we really want to make sure, I have to know the patient that I'm working with, because if you want more babies, if you want to have your sperm work for you and make humans, uh, it's really important that you don't use testosterone therapy for the most part, because it will make you infertile. So it's important that my recommendations are not for all men, for all situations, for all. Um, every person is different and the risk benefits are going to be different for different people. But we do have a lot of FDA approved options for male testosterone, whereas for female testosterone, which is also important, we have no FDA approved options. So um, let's talk about them for a minute. So when we're talking about testosterone, we've got gels and creams. So things that you rub on your skin, and those are typically daily, um, often uh, generic, not that expensive, usually pretty well covered by insurance. Um, there are injections, which are very inexpensive. Uh, actually incredibly inexpensive and, and quite cost effective. And those injections can be anywhere uh, from weekly to twice a week. Usually weekly is probably fine. Um, they also have uh, pills and the pills are actually coming, uh, getting a lot more um, news these days, the pills. Uh, there's some new pills that have been recently FDA approved. And I was just at a, a scientific meeting where there was a lot of buzz and excitement about testosterone pills. Um, we also, there is a patch, although I don't see too many people using Use a patch. Um, it is available, I know, for the veterans uh, at the VA uh, system. I don't see it used too much uh, outside of the VA. Um, and we also have intranasal testosterone, where you can sort of uh, put, uh, put it up your nose two to three times a day, which uh, can be a very interesting form of testosterone. So we've got, I, I don't know, did I miss anything, Dr. Schwartz? I think... Um, I think I, go, yeah. I went through most I, of them. Covered, you covered a bunch of them. I want to unpack some of them a little bit just to kind of dive in a little bit deeper. So you first mentioned kind of like the creams and the gels. Mm -hmm. So first question is, where are you administering this? Where are you rubbing this on? Yeah, so the cream, the 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 one that a lot of people use is, is a gel um, that sort of looks like a soap dispenser, where it kind of gives you a foamy. You think of the foam soaps that you put your, you, you know, you uh, when you wash your hands, and so you get that foamy, um, uh, foamy substance, and you just put it on your shoulders. Usually, I'll have uh, guys do it on each shoulder, so it's two pumps: one pump for one shoulder, one pump for the other shoulder. They can kind of rub it on their chest as well. Those tend to be the places where the gels and the creams are applied. Are those creams like very noticeable? Are you walking around like that uh, middle-aged dad with a zinc oxide in their nose or is it kind of get absorbed and you're not seeing it or feeling it? It's a great question. It does get absorbed and you're not seeing it or feeling it. It does have an odor to it that some people don't love or some partners don't love. Um, some patients, um, it's really important if you're going to use a cream or a gel that you make sure it fully dries before snuggling up to your partner or your animal, small animals or small children. There is a worry for transference. So if I've got a guy with young kids or lots of animals in bed or a partner that you know likes to snuggle, um, sometimes I'll recommend the injectables because there's 
there's not as much risk of, of the transference there. So um, it's not right for everybody. But yeah, no, it, you don't look like the zinc oxide guy. Got it. So, but that I just want to re re double double click on that for a second in terms of uh, transmissibility. So, what you're saying is that if I'm if I'm rubbing on this testosterone on my chest and then I t I take and I I don't wait long enough and I take my two year old and snuggle. Uh, uh, them on my chest, I could potentially transfer that hormone actually to the child. So you have to yeah. have some concern, right? Yeah, you definitely want to be careful in those situations, which is why, again, when you buy stuff on the internet and when you talk to, you know, and you're not going talking to actual doctors or you only get a five minute visit, you want to make sure that you're really, you know, knowing what you're getting and, and, and all of the risk, because there's very safe ways to do it, but but you also want to know the, the kind of nuances here. Yeah, I'm just I'm just laughing to myself about you know like the like the the poodle getting the uh, the testosterone and all of a sudden being the the coolest poodle uh, on the block, right? It's it's true that poodle would have huge balls and uh, you know something <laughs> good happening to the poodle, but but we have to you know and it's funny they we talk about animal uh, transfers to animals all the time. I haven't heard of an animal. Maybe your listeners can find me good articles and papers about animals getting androgenized or too much testosterone. Uh, yeah. Maybe a little more rough rough at the playground at the dog parks for perhaps. Yeah, that's what I've heard, actually, that they get pretty aggressive. Yeah. So, uh, you know, again, but so important because you, as you mentioned, in a five minute visit, you can't cover everything. And it's something that could be a, a monumental, uh, uh, you know, impact on the ones you love around you, right? Absolutely. I've seen um, some data that, you know, putting a, your t-shirt then in the washer and dryer, you know, that with your family's clothing on, maybe there's some risk. Again, I haven't seen major things play out there, but things to be sort of concerned about with the creams and the gels. Got it. So creams and gels don't sound too too scary, right? I, I put on suntan lotion before. Uh, injections, though, now now you're piquing my interest of a little bit of, of I'm a little nervous. So yeah. what what exactly are we injecting? Are we talking a big needle? Or are we talking a little needle? What give me some context of what we're injecting exactly? Absolutely. Yes, Absolutely. So again, the daily gels, you have to do it every day. And, and you really, you know, that can get annoying for some people to remember something every day. And, and um, the injections, though, uh, it's nice because you only have to do it pretty much once a week. Now, occasionally we'll have people do it twice a week, but most of the time it's a once a week injection. Now, there's two ways to do it. Well, three ways. Uh, one is intramuscular and the other is a subcutaneous. And those are fancy words, but subcutaneous is kind of in your belly fat. So it's a pretty small needle, uh, not too much, you know, testosterone, liquid testosterone is very uh, viscous. It's very thick. I uh, think of it almost like honey, uh, a sort of thing. And so you have to use a little bit bigger of a needle to push that honey through the syringe. So you, um, you sort of grab your belly fat and put the needle all the way in and then um, inject the medication. Um, it's, it's, um, it's kind of how uh, diabetics often will inject their, you know, medications through the belly fat. The other option is what we call intramuscular muscular. And we used to use a lot more intramuscular testosterone until we, we realized that sub Q is probably just fine. And the intramuscular testosterone, typically I'll have guys do it in their um, outside thigh area. Uh, mm -hmm. And we teach them how to do in the outer thigh. Uh, the butt injections, you could do that, but you got to get a partner to, it's really hard to inject your own butt. Um, and so that's an option. I forgot to talk about pellet therapy, um, which is, um, a, there is an FDA approved pellet option for testosterone where you get these little, almost like grains of rice put in your butt but, you know, every, every four to six months. And, and that's another really good option uh, for a lot well, of we're guys. We're definitely going to unpack that one in a minute. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't go, stay tuned for that. One I can be sure. a, I can be a pain in your butt, a pain in your <laughs> leg, a pain in your belly. So it's really, it's about what, what, you know, what, how, how, how much you're willing to, you know, um, put up with to, to feel better. And, and that can be a challenge. So it's really, you know, I've had guys who've come to me totally needle phobic, uh, mm -hmm. who are like, Ruben, I ain't sticking nothing, nowhere. You got to be crazy. And then, they get so tired of the gels that we we sort of slowly get them to do it and they realize it really doesn't hurt. It's really no big deal. They can get their partner to do it. They can do it. Um, and, and it's been pretty great for a lot of my patients. One one concern that guys have, aside from the, the needle phobia, because, you know, we tend to be a little bit more squeamish than women, um, is the concern of can I hurt myself with the injection, not from the testosterone itself, but from the actual injection? Can, can yeah. guys do real harm with that at home? You know, um, what we teach really good injection technique. You want to make sure you get good advice. Um, you know, of bad things can always happen 
in anything that we do. And so certainly, but it is very rare um, to harm yourself if you're doing correct injection in the correct way with the correct dose, you know, and, and you're seeing a doctor who knows what they're doing. Now, certainly you can get things like I've had men get cellulitis where they get a, a skin infection, um, you know, from the injection. I've had, I've had that happen before. Um, I've had guys get little um, um, knots under their, their tit, like kind of almost a fat scar that happens underneath their skin. Uh, and they notice these little spots, they typically go away. Um, and so there's no perfect um, uh, solution, but but typically they're pretty safe and, and they work pretty well. Now, when you use an injectable, we do see um, a little bit increase in what we'll talk about in a little bit, which is the high blood counts. Uh, and so it is really important when you're using any kind of testosterone, you must get monitored blood levels, uh, not just of your testosterone levels, but of your blood counts, because you can get a thickening of the, the blood counts, um, which usually is not an emergency of that you have to, you know, but usually we'll either change your dose or we'll recommend um, uh, you donating some blood. And so everything you mentioned from the teaching to the, the monitoring is an important fact here. Um, some guys are getting testosterone online. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, it's a big business now. Um, how are those guys being taught? Like, I mean, how, how does that work or do, or do you even know? You know, it's a big problem because honestly, men feel better when they are on testosterone and um, when they need it, when they are having low levels. I always joke, I say the guys who need testosterone aren't using it or being offered it. And the guys that probably don't need testosterone are using way too much of it, right? right. You've got these bodybuilders who probably don't need any and are using tons. And you've got these diabetics who maybe are a little overweight and, and really sluggish and can't kind of get, get, get going, you know, because their levels are so low. And so um, the problem is, is just like you said, it takes some discussion. It takes some education. No one wants to do it, right? Your primary care docs, they know they have to do too many things. Your endocrinologists are really focused on a lot of the diabetes and the thyroid conditions. And this isn't fun for them for whatever reason, nor are they as sort of into it, I find. You know, there are endocrinologists who specialize in this who are wonderful, but the general, um, the general practitioners and the general endocrinologists don't tend to want to take this on. And it's hard to find a urologist to also want to take this on. And again, while they can do it, if they're not passionate about it, if they'd much rather do kidney stones or prostate cancer or things like that, they're going to say, oh, it's okay. Your testosterone of 306 is fine. You're normal, you know, suck it up. So guys don't have a lot of options and they end up going to these online charlatans, as you've, uh, as you've said, you know, people who maybe aren't giving the best or most evidence-based advice out there. But in a way, the patients are sort of, what are they going to do? They want to feel better and they want something to make them feel better. Is there an ideal doctor? I mean, this probably not, I don't know the answers, but is there an ideal type of doctor that a guy, if, if they're interested in testosterone therapy, isn't an endocrinologist? Is it a urologist? Is it a primary doctor? Like who is that ideal doctor that would take this seriously and really help them with this in your mind? I think it's the doctor, you know, again, I always say about this about sexual medicine is nobody owns sexual medicine. You know, it is not a urologic problem or a gynecology problem, but there are many of us sort of who uh, really pride themselves on focusing on these quality of life issues. So there are endocrinologists who sort of are interested in this space. Um, there are primary care doctors who are interested in this space. So you have to kind of interview your doctor a little bit. And if you find, you know, and it's important if your doctor says, listen, this is, you know, I don't agree with you doing this, you know, and they may be completely right. If your testosterone is 500 and you're asking for testosterone therapy, maybe it's not the right answer for you. But if your testosterone is the low 300s or 200s and you're feeling sluggish and you've got erectile issues and your doctor's blowing you off, that's when you say, okay, doc, I know this isn't your specialty. You can't know everything about everything. Is there someone in the community that you would recommend or do your own Google searching, you know, and go looking for those experts. You know, uh, uh, again, the Sexual Medicine Society of North America has a find a provider tool. Uh, so we can definitely link to that, you know, in the show notes. Um, you know, there are, there are doctors out there who care about this. You know, that's that's great advice. You you really want to go to somebody who actually cares about this problem because a lot of doctors admittedly uh, brush it under the rug and just say, let's move on to that next patient. We it's doctors, we like to talk about what we know a lot about because as you can tell, we talk nonstop and we love to hear ourselves speak. But when you when a patient comes in and they want to talk about something that you don't know anything about, doctors will try to change the conversation very quickly because they're embarrassed or uncomfortable with this idea that they're not an expert. I wish more doctors 
doctors would sit, say, okay, you know, this isn't my area of expertise, but hey, go see Ruben down the street because she knows that this is what she cares about. And I always joke with my providers, my referring providers is I do the crap they don't want to do, right? And so when a patient comes in and they're going to take extra time and they're talking about pelvic pain or hormone issues or sexual problems, that's when you get to say, hey, I hear you. This is real. This is not my expertise. But again, go see my colleague, Dr. Ruben, because this is what she cares about. And so then your patient is happy with you because you gave them a name. Um, they're not mad. They actually think you're a great doctor because they kind of, you're expanding that team. You know, we can't all do everything. You don't want to see me for your, you know, acute um, kidney stone at this point. Like, I don't want to take care of your kidney stone. Yeah. That's so true. That is so, so true, especially about the, the discomfort level and, and kind of wanting to push it along. Now, we, we, we talked a little bit about injections, about doing it themselves. Is there a scenario where men come in to get injections to like the clinic? Is that a possibility too for those that are really needle phobic and wouldn't imagine injecting themselves? There are certainly some old school providers out there who sort of bill for it and take your insurance and have guys come in every week uh, for their injections. I still see it happening in a few areas in, in my area. Um, I typically don't do this. You know, I really, again, if guys are in DC, we've got a very, um, a very smart patient population and they usually can figure it out pretty well. And we, we can teach them how to you know, teach a man to fish and he can uh, eat for a lifetime. So we really try to teach guys how to do it, but I do see some people having you come into the office to get it done. Got it. And you mentioned implantable pellets. So I'm assuming the upside of that is that get it done. And you, you said it, it lasts a few months. You don't have to keep injecting. Can you give us a little bit more detail in terms of kind of how this works with pellets? Yeah. So there's there are FDA approved pellets, which I'm going to focus my attention on. And there are non-FDA approved pellets. And the non-FDA approved pellets, I would steer clear from only because there's no regulation really. So the FDA doesn't look at it. So they could be implanting... You you know, snake oil for all, all we know. And so you got to be careful when you go to these clinics and they're using non-FDA approved products. So again, we just don't know what's in them. They say it's testosterone. They say it's from a reputable source, but we just don't have that assurance. And so I like FDA approved products where I can find them. And so there is an FDA approved pellet um, uh, option. Um, it is often covered by insurance, but we find that sometimes your insurance will only cover about six pellets, uh, where most guys tend to need about 10 to 12 pellets to feel good and to get their numbers to where they need to be. And so sometimes guys have to pay out of pocket for those extra pellets. And so it's, um, you come in for a procedure, um, they sort of um, uh, clean your butt really well. So there's no bacteria on it. They put a, um, a an insertion tool, which sort of is no bigger than kind of this pen. And they put it inside uh, your, um, the, the fat of the butt. And they put in these, uh, you know, six to 12 pellets um, inside uh, the, 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 uh, butt fat, if you will. And mm -hmm. so it's um, kind of a pain in your butt for about a, a week or so. You know, these guys, you, we put some ice packs on it. They're a little bit sore. We don't want them swimming, you know, going into lakes or pools, you know, for a week or so afterwards until they've healed. Um, and and so the, the biggest problem with pellets is we can't take them out. So if you have a bad side, I never start a guy on pellets only, right? You know, I want to know how he's going to feel on testosterone. So the pellet guy is the guy who's been on injections or creams. He feels great. He loves it but he's just tired of injecting himself or using creams. I would say, okay, let's transition you to pellets. That way I see him, you know, two to three times a year. We put it in, in a way we set it and forget it. Um, you still want to monitor your levels because you don't want them getting too, too high uh, or your blood counts getting too, too high. And so um, um, they can be a great option. Mm -hmm. And you said uh, two times, so they last about four to six months. Yeah, yeah. And everyone eats them up at different levels. And so we definitely want to check your levels and monitor. And then once you start, once you get it a few times, you get on a pretty good um, sort of, um, you, you get on a good schedule. When it's time to go to that next one, you said you're not taking the old pellets out. You're just putting new pellets in into the same place or a different part. Does your butt look start looking like a checkerboard after a while? Or what it's is a that great, is you get a little tiny scar. There is, uh, yeah, well, you typically switch butt cheeks each time. So you go from left to right to left to right. Um, but um, you don't, you know, um, you see little tiny scars sometimes from the, um, the insertion tool, but usually you heal pretty darn well. Got it. Now, a, a minute back, you or a couple minutes back, you said, Pills, oral testosterone. Now, most guys out there are saying, wait a minute, I can take a pill. What, why are we talking about butt implants and, and injections? Like, just give me a pill. What's the big deal? 
So what's the big deal? What's going on with the pills? It's really exciting stuff. And I can't, you know, I will say that it's um, a little bit newer to the market. We used to have testosterone pills and they were very, very bad for the liver. And there were right. all sorts of problems with them with digestion and you can't eat a fatty meal. And there were all these rules. And there have been, again, pandemic hit while some of these products were coming to market. And so there are some urologists out there who have a lot of experience with the new oral options. And some of us who don't have as much experience with it, but I would say um, keep your ears open because there's a couple of very exciting options. And even now there are a couple of exciting options available. We just, again, they're pretty new to the market. And so we're still all, all of the experts are getting comfortable using them and also getting comfortable figuring out the insurance issues. Because, you know, if you get this option, but you have to pay, you know, three, a lot of money, uh, you know, it's, it's not doable to get a lot of patients on these therapies. And a lot of times insurance companies will say, oh, well, you have to try and fail the creams and the gels and all of these other things before we'll even make it an option to try this other one. So there's often a lot of hoops that we have to jump through. So um, yes, the oral option is an exciting uh, a, um, a newer option. And just to be clear, the oral option is FDA approved or it's still pending FDA approval? It's FDA, it's FDA approved, yeah. And it's a daily pill? Oof, you're going to get me. I'm pretty sure it's a daily pill. I uh, I just got back from the um, sexual medicine meeting and I was going to look more into it myself in terms of um, how often, twice a day, twice a day with food. Got it. So it sounds like, again, you being, a, you know, an expert in sexual medicine, it sounds like this is not something that most of the doctors are using yet. They're kind of like exploring it, but it's not like you're going to go to the doctor and like, oh, sure, here it is. Yeah, it most like of them have never heard. Most of them have never heard of it. It's it's sort of this is prime time. You're you're watching science happen live, uh, kind of That's thing. Exciting. And so it is exciting. And and again, um, uh, as we learn more, as we get more comfortable with it, um, you know, uh, we will start talking about it a whole lot more. To your knowledge, I mean, you you had mentioned this was my understanding as well. When I, when we used to hear about testosterone pills, it'd be like, "Are you crazy? It can it's toxic to the liver." All the things you mentioned. So I'm assuming that these pills, it's not that they're just less so; they just don't have the, that side effect profile, or is it just a, a toned down version? Uh, from what I understand, it is a new sort of delivery system orally that is allowing it to sort of not behave the way the old oral testosterones um, have behaved. But I will say that this is not, I was not a part of any of the clinical trials. And so I don't have as much experience uh, sort of with it. And so I don't want to speak, uh, as I know, my my mentors are, are listening somewhere, you know, yelling at me for not knowing all these answers right now. <laughs> you're doing great you're doing great That's right. this, is, this, is, this is exciting because this is very cutting edge and new do you i mean obviously not knowing the full picture but do you see these as replacing like do, like doing a, creating a paradigm shift in testosterone therapy um you know again it's a lot of it depends on the insurers and and what what guys can get access to because if you have the best you know if you look at some of these intranasal testosterones they're great options but if guys can't get get them because of insurance uh, um, hurdles then the providers just stick to the things that they know their patients can get and so the the problem is that we're very slow to adapt uh, to some of these newer therapies because they're not um, uh, financially feasible for many of our patients. Got it. You can still hear me okay, right? I hear you fine. You're just a little frozen. Yeah, the video seems to be frozen. Well, that's okay. You don't. Nobody needs to see me, so that's okay. Um, so a question for you. In terms of, we, we talked about these different um, modalities. We talked about um, injections. We talked about pills. We talked about uh, creams. Are any of them superior to others, like in terms of um, their efficacy? Um, well, so that's again where it becomes really important to monitor levels and also check in with your patients to see how they're feeling. So I always tell my patients that this is not Viagra. This is not you put it on the first day and you feel like a superhuman, that this is sort of a little bit of a marathon that you've got to, you know, use it for four to six months to really see the benefit. But if you put a cream on for four to six months and you don't absorb it well, then we just wasted four to six months because you were not getting good levels um, and you're not going to feel the benefit. 
benefits if your numbers don't go up. And so uh, I have guys whose maybe numbers aren't don't go up as much as I would like, but they feel great. So, you know, you take that in context. Um, so I think it's really important to look at numbers and look at how you're feeling and also to give it time. Um, I really, really strongly recommend my patients give it sort of that four to six months um, to kind of see how they're feeling. Got it. But otherwise, the, there's no advantage in terms of efficacy of, let's say, um, injectable testosterone versus cream testosterone. All of them can get your levels up to therapeutic levels, meaning good good doses and good levels for, for your bloodstream. But just getting the numbers up doesn't always mean that you're going to feel better. And so it's important to kind of, and we don't have a, everything works for one guy, but not the other guy. So it's a little bit of, if you find that something's not working for you, then you could switch modalities to see if it works, if something else works a little bit better. But um, if, if that makes sense. Now the injections often will get your blood counts a little bit higher uh, and get your numbers up a little bit higher, a little faster. And so that's, you know, a, a one sort of benefit to the injectables, but I get numbers up pretty high with a lot of guys with just the creams. Got it. And, you know, you mentioned that for the cream, there's one problem with, you know, the potential transmissibility. Are the side effects generally the same across these different type of moda treatment modalities for testosterone therapy? Yeah, we, we see a lot of the similar side effects. It's a great question. So um, you're going to, any of the transdermal, meaning through the skin therapies, I can't speak to the oral testosterone side effects, uh, as you know, um, but I will say, you know, for the, anything that goes through your skin, a cream or an injection, um, uh, you know, oily skin and acne can be side effects, you know, hair growth, hair loss. So you can get, you know, if you give it to a transgender person, they can grow a beard uh, and they can get a bald head. Um, uh, so oily skin, acne, hair growth, and hair loss. Um, and then your blood counts can get, you know, can, can creep up. And so you really want to make sure you're you're um, watching the blood counts. Now, you also, we don't have great data to show that if your blood counts get really high, that you will definitely have a stroke or a blood clot or something like that. But that's the theoretical fear that we all want to avoid. Got it. And uh, so you're checking blood counts per periodically to, to basically avoid those theoretical risks, at least. Exactly. Maybe, like, stroke, yeah. heart attack, stuff like that. Um, there were also, can you, some other um, side effects, again, that I guess I've come across that I wanted, was hoping you can comment on. One was, uh, they mentioned breast enlargement in men. Do, do you see that a lot with testosterone replacement? I don't see it as much with the testosterone. So as testosterone can convert to estrogen, um, and so there's an enzyme that lives in fat cells uh, that can convert your testosterone to estrogen. So when we see guys do having enlargement of breast or breast tenderness, we do often check their estrogen levels to make sure those aren't getting too high. We tend mm -hmm. to see that a little bit more with um, the estrogen mod or the testosterone modulators that we use for fertility patients as opposed to testosterone itself. But certainly if you had a patient or you were a patient who had some breast tenderness, you'd want to make sure you see a doctor who can check your estrogen levels and make sure that that's okay. Got it. And what about um, the other thing that comes up a lot is, is prostate issues, right? That uh, testosterone affects the prostate. And if you're already having issues with urination, what they call BPH, uh, it makes it worse. Have you found that to be the case? So there's a lot of controversy um, in this space, and I have not seen any data that overwhelmingly shows that your prostate symptoms will get worse. Listen, your penis, your prostate, your pelvic floor, it's all muscle. And if that muscle is uh, healthy, then it's going to work better. And testosterone makes muscles healthy. And so I believe getting guys therapeutic on their testosterone actually can be good for pelvic floor and prostate issues. Uh, that being said, there was some old school thinking uh, about a fear behind using testosterone um, uh, in prostate issues. Now the prostate cancer, there's a lot of controversy around that as well, which we've learned a lot more about over the years. And, and a lot of doctors, even within the American Urologic Guidelines, there's a lot less fear about using testosterone in men who have a family history of prostate cancer, are worried about prostate cancer, and even some who have are on sort of active surveillance for low risk prostate cancer. Yeah, that, that is a big a big thing to a big paradigm shift also that's occurring for sure. Uh, okay, so you know we we talked a little bit about uh, the different side effects, uh, what to expect. Now, um, in the conversation with Dr. Perlman, we briefly touched upon 
labs and thresholds to get started. I think it's worth repeating. Um, what When you see a guy for low testosterone and you're considering starting treatment, is there some type of threshold for testosterone that qualifies them for testosterone therapy? So uh, again, um, whatever Dr. Perlman says is true. So if I disagree <laughs> with her, go with what she says. Um, but what I would say is there's a lot of disagreement, even within the different societies. So I go with, I'm a urologist. I love the American Urologic Association guidelines. Guidelines are not the Bible. It is not the law. Uh, it is just sort of a general guidance. And so the, the AUA, American Urologic Association guidelines, put us at about 300. And so if your testosterone is below 300 and you have symptoms, remember, just like Dr. Schwartz said, you're feeling fatigue, you've got low energy, you're falling asleep at dinner, your erections are not as hard, your libido is not as strong, and you're below 300, well then, yeah, you're, you're, I'm going to qualify you as having low testosterone and your insurance will probably pay for therapy or certain therapies. If you're at 306 uh, mm -hmm. and you're feeling all of those symptoms, I'm still going to diagnose you as having low testosterone and I'm going to recommend therapy, but your insurance company might not pay uh, for those different different options. Now, if you look at the endocrine society guidelines, their threshold um, is different. And so it's really important that who's reading your labs and a lot of primary care doctors don't really um, have guidance. And so they may look at the range that the lab core or quest or whatever lab is reading and they say, oh, well, it's in the normal range. So you're normal. Mm -hmm. And that's um, not always true. And so it's really confusing when you're just a guy who feels like crap, who just wants to feel better and you're getting six different answers from, you know, uh, five different doctors. And so it can be really challenging uh, to understand that. So what I would say is my, my general rule is if you're below 300 and you're having symptoms, then we should treat you. If you're below 300 and you feel great, then you're fine. You're normal. We don't have to treat you. And so it's important to, you know, talk to somebody who's going to listen and say, okay, here are the pros, here are the cons. Because if you're below 300, but your erections are great, you've got good energy, you're working out, you feel good. Um, why would I put you on a therapy of something that you have to do every single day, potentially for the rest of your life, right? It, it doesn't make it, if it's not, if you're not broken, I don't want to, I don't want to fix you if that makes sense. That's such a good point. Yeah, I mean, it's all it's just a number, right? Is it really the symptoms have to go with it for sure? Now, assuming, um, okay, my let's say my levels below three hundred, um, is dosing kind of one size fits all, or are, do you have different doses for different guys, and what do you base that on? Yeah, so a great question as well. Again, I'm going to look at your numbers and I'm going to look at how you're feeling. And so if we take the gel, for example, you're going to do two pumps on your shoulders and you come back, we check levels at about a month or so, maybe six weeks, and you're no better than you were before, then we can say, okay, we're not getting great levels here. Let's go up to three pumps or four pumps, uh, you know, and see what numbers we get. If we're still not budging at that point, I'm going to say, I don't like gels for you. You're just not an absorber. You know, you're maybe you're tough, you're thick skinned, you're not absorbing well. Maybe we switch you to a different modality and then I might jump to intranasal or injectable or something else, you know, and then again, we check the levels and I sort of have my starting dose and I start somewhere, check your numbers. And then if you're not feeling, uh, you know, and it, you, or if your numbers aren't going up, we may adjust the dose a little bit. Now we don't want super therapeutic levels where you're like way off the charts. Um, that's where, you know, you run into some more side effects and things like that. So we, I try to get guys in the middle to high range of what the normal values are. So you're looking at the 500, seven, you know, the kind of four to seven hundreds is where I'm, you know, happiest, uh, you know, for my patients. Now, again, there are going to be people who listen to this, who disagree with me and say, Ruben doesn't know what she's talking about. I'm a bodybuilder and I, I go on all these message boards and, you know, and, and all I can say is this is sort of what we are taught within our societies and where the experts in testosterone sort of like to keep us. So I might be too conservative for some and way too uh, aggressive for others. So nobody likes what I have to say is uh, pretty much how it goes. <laughs> Perfect. You're in a great place to be then. Um, but so the if, so your goal is about, let's say, four to 700. Again, your person doesn't have to be for everyone, but your person goes four to 700. You mentioned super therapeutic. Is there such a thing as overdosing on testosterone? And what does that look like? Yeah, you know, I, it's just, it's it's kind of where we get into these data-free zones where we just don't know. And so when you're looking at testosterone's over a thousand and uh, guys or transgender guys are living at these super, super high doses, 
we just don't have a lot of data to say, listen, you're at a risk for stroke, you're at a risk for blood clots, you're at a risk for heart attacks. And so I, li I like to live in, in a more data zone. Now, don't get me wrong. There are moments where I, I, um, I uh, think data-free zones have to happen sometimes, but there is no great data that show if you're at 800 versus 1200, that you're going to feel that much better. Like your symptom improvement is going to peak at some point and you're, you're, you're going to get diminishing returns the higher you go. And with more risks, basically. With, with so, potential more risks. Exactly. Got it. Um, when you're starting to take testosterone therapy, <clears throat> how soon should the guy expect to feel a palpable difference and whatever was bothering him, whether it was brain fog, excuse me, <clears throat> whether it was brain fog, fatigue, sexual function, when do we start to notice the lift? Yeah, I've had guys notice it pretty quickly, um, maybe within, um, you know, four to six weeks. But I really try to, uh, I, I believe that low expectations is the key to happiness in life. And so I will tell guys, you're not going to notice much for that four to six months. Like, I really want to give it time. Because think about it, you have to build muscle, you have to build a muscle memory, you have to, you know, these, this testosterone gets into your body, then it has to get into the cells, it has to make proteins, which have to work on your body. So it takes time for all of that, you're you're building things. So it takes time. So you really want to sort of let guys know that it's going to take time. Now, that being said, I've had guys come into my office who within a month or six weeks start feeling, you know, just better energy, better sleep, um, you know, um, better mood, uh, maybe some better erections, um, but it's not the same for everybody. And to that same end uh, about expectations, what you talked about expectations of time, right? What about the expectation of effect? What type of honest expectation in terms of true improvement across those different parameters, uh, you know, uh, energy, uh, brain acuity, uh, erections, when you counsel your patients, what is that level of lift? that you, that they can expect, honestly speaking and realistically speaking, I should say. I love, I love that question because I think it's really important is I undersell and I try to undersell and over deliver. And so when we see with testosterone is we're looking for mild improvements. I want to see a little bit of improvement in your libido. I want to see a little bit of improvement in your erections. I want to see a little bit of improvement with your energy, but if you're eating like crap and you're not exercising and you're not sleeping, listen, I think sleep is actually one of the things that we stink at as urologists is being able to see a guy and say, actually, you need a sleep study because your testosterone is so low because you're not sleeping because you have sleep apnea or because you have bad sleep hygiene or because you're an investment banker that's working a hundred and million hours a week. And so if you don't sleep, you're not going to restore and get your testicles to work so that they can make the testosterone that your body needs to heal. And no amount of testosterone is going to overcome that crappy sleep. And so I think it's really important to understand the whole whole picture of your patients and you are not just a testosterone number, nor is testosterone replacement going to make you a superhero and Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and sort of make you, and you have to do the work. Uh, and so exercising, eating right, sleeping, all of those really horrible things that nobody has time or energy or, or can do easily. But I believe that giving guys some testosterone to give them a little boost of energy so that they can get their workouts started, so they can start feeling good. And it, it's kind of a, a nice motivator. And I, I see that in my practice. I really do. Um, and so, you know, I, I sort of really try to give those subtle improvements. Uh, and as I said, I try really hard to under promise and over deliver because it's not the fountain of youth. It will not solve your relationship problems. It will not make you a better partner in bed. Uh, you know, there are many things that testosterone will not do. No, that's, that's such a good point because there's two levels there. At the one hand, this is not a cure-all. It's not going, you're not going to take a pill or do an injection and all of a sudden become Superman. But on the other hand, it does help. And it can potentially, if guys see it as a stepping stone rather than the entire solution, I think that's the half the battle is won. Because as you said, if you, if it gives you the energy or maybe it gives you a little bit more confidence in bed or some, or makes you think a little bit more clearly, it will give you the confidence to maybe take those other steps to get you over the finish line. And I love that approach, right? Because it just needs to be seen as a, a part of the puzzle, not the entire solution, but also not to be thought of poo-pooing and say, ah, it doesn't do anything. It's just, it's just a, a band-aid. So I, I think that's a great way to think about it. 
I think the key is, is as doctors and you're all just the best at this, we understand quality of life. You deserve a good quality of life. You deserve a good sex life. You deserve good erections. You deserve uh, to pee uh, uh, as freely as you want to and not wake up in the middle of the night a million times. We love quality of life, but some of our colleagues in other fields don't think that way. They think more, we want to prevent any risk possible and we want to keep you as safe as possible. Whereas as you're all just, we're like, hey, sure, take this Viagra. It may cause, you know, low blood pressure and blindness and all these other things that can happen, but you're going to get a damn good erection and, and you're going to give us a high five when you leave the, the office. And so right. we are unique providers where we love quality of life. And so that's why I sort of try to get urologists to care about women's sexual health, because that story is a whole other, you know, a, a, a whole other podcast about why your partner might be suffering, you know, and, and not feeling as good because her testosterone goes to zero, her estrogen goes to zero. And actually there was some great data at this meeting we went to showing that estrogen is actually that libido booster. You know, men live at an estrogen of 25. You need estrogen in your body. And we actually think the estrogen may be driving libido more than the testosterone. So stay tuned for some very interesting data on that. We're getting some late breaking updates here with Dr. Rubin for sure, guys, that this is amazing. Um, I want to touch base, follow up on follow up. How, how, how appropriate. Um, so you had mentioned that obviously you don't just give testosterone and you hope for the best. You have to keep track of things. One thing you, tr you said you keep track of is the actual testosterone level, which is important for adjustments. What other kind of things are you tracking over time with your patients that are on testosterone? What are the parameters? The most important one is really that blood count, what we call a CBC or your hemoglobin and hematocrit. Those are words you're going to hear your doctor say. And that is sort of how um, uh, the red blood cells, how many of them, the concentration of the red blood cells, um, when you give testosterone, that goes up. And sometimes actually uh, there was a very great paper by a colleague of ours who, um, who said the guys who get really high levels of blood counts on testosterone tend to have sleep apnea. And if you treat their sleep apnea, it goes away. So again, another uh, big uh, plug for if you're snoring a lot, if you got a big neck, uh, if your wife's always kicking you or your husband's always kicking you because you're snoring all the time, really think about getting that sleep study because that is a really important sort of marker of poor sleep and maybe another reason why your testosterone levels might be low. Yeah, we, we recently did an episode with uh, with a sleep specialist, and it was a, it really enlightening to know how many medical issues sleep apnea can cause. It, it's yeah. just really, really eye-opening. Now, how often are, are is the doctor generally going to be doing these blood tests to, to make sure that everything's okay? So typically I like to get it, you know, we're all a little different about when we get it and how often we get it. You know, I definitely like to get it early on in that first four to six weeks, just to kind of make sure the levels are going well. And then I like to check that blood count, you know, at, you know, four to six months, you know, to see what we're doing. And then I'm, you know, many people are kind of once a year lab doers. I, I tend to be a little bit more of a twice a year person. I love my patients. So I, 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 I tend to hold on to them a little a tighter than some. Um, and that's what I would say is kind of the, the, the most important once you get on your regular dose and you're you're doing you, then you can usually get to the once a year type of thing and in the process as you're doing these tests is there a scenario where testosterone has to be suspended ever well there are some guys you know again uh, talk to a bunch it, it's always have a conversation with your medical team right and so i, I spend a lot of time in my practice talking to other providers and really kind of making what we call shared decision making is there are going to be times, right? If you get metastatic prostate cancer, you bet your butt your oncologist is going to say, you got to get off this testosterone. Or if you get any prostate cancer, a lot of the docs are going to say, get off this testosterone. But again, there are reasons why a guy may say, no, I'm going to stay on it for X, Y, and Z. Or, or again, it's, this is your life. This is your um, sort of a medical history. We make bad decisions all the time. People smoke, people drink, people do drugs drugs, people do all sorts of things. So it's all about shared decision-making and really understanding, well, what are the risks? You know, what are the true risks? If you have a blood clot, it is likely your doctors would tell you to stop testosterone. And are they wrong or right? Science hasn't fully agreed on that yet, but in the, in over being cautious, uh, it, it probably makes sense that you may get switched off that therapy. Now, if then you're feeling miserable and horrible and you can't get out of bed and it's your quality of life at stake, then some doctors would agree to a lower dose or a trial of it. And so I can't speak with full certainty to say, yes, absolutely. You cannot have, you know, testosterone, um, but it's nuanced. And you also have to understand that your doctors have different risk 
um, uh, risk levels, you know, like some of your doctors went to the grocery store during COVID and some of them did not, right, order their groceries online and some of them sure. went to the hospital every day and some of them did all telemedicine. And so even your doctor has different comfort levels of what they're comfortable with. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good point. Now, bad things aside, if everything's going copacetic, as they say, is to, can you say that testosterone is safe for the long haul? I mean, is this a solution that if somebody coming in their 50s, they can potentially be on testosterone for the next 30 years? Of course, with the caveats that their blood count is okay, there's nothing crazy happening. Is this safe for the long term? So there's a big study that came out a couple of years ago called like the aging male study, you know, on testosterone. I may be getting the title wrong, but it basically looked at older guys on testosterone therapy and it took older guys and a little bit sicker guys and they were on testosterone and, and the, the outcomes were like, you know, their erections got a little bit better. Their sexual function got a little bit better and they felt better on the drugs, but it wasn't huge. It was like a, a, a statistically significant amount and that, that they were happy and there were some improvements. The headlines, but, but the most important takeaway was that it wasn't dangerous. There were mm -hmm. not increased risk of side effects or bad things happening. These guys weren't dropping dead at a higher rate of heart attacks or blood clots or anything like that. And yeah. the, head, the headlines were incredible. The headlines when the study came out were testosterone doesn't work. <laughs> like that was the headline. Whereas my community saw it and said, look at this. It's not hurting anybody. It's helping these guys quality of life. They're happy. Leave these old men alone. And the headline was do not give testosterone. It doesn't work. <laughs> and that is like in a nutshell, everything that's wrong with female sexual medicine and female hormones and male hormones is this idea of what, what are we treating and what risk are we willing to take? So I don't believe there is an age, right? And um, I'll say my father-in-law is in his, well into his eighties and is on testosterone. Uh, and uh, is a retired neurosurgeon and loves to talk to me about, you know, his uh, different medical conditions. And there is no, you know, he's a prostate cancer survivor and there's no time he's going to stop this therapy. And part of it, he is, you know, in his mid eighties and he's exercising every day and he's eating right. And he looks like he's in his, you know, sixties. And so, uh, you know, let the guy do what he wants to do. Like, I, I have no reason to believe that this is hurting him. In fact, I believe he is as healthy as he is probably because he has been on this therapy. Well, that's a very inspirational place to 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 stop for sure, uh, Dr. Rubin. Thank you so much for uh, enlightening us about uh, testosterone therapy and the real logistics of it, because that's when you when you get to the the details is where people get lost. Before we let you go, we uh, I want to ask you a question that I ask all our experts on uh, the podcast, having nothing to do with testosterone whatsoever. At least maybe not. Maybe it is. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, as uh, an expert, you've obviously attained a significant amount of success in your own life, personally, professionally, what's the secret to your success? Ooh, uh, I think the secret to my success is uh, working my butt off and not thinking I'm successful in anything that I do, but always wanting to learn more, uh, do more, uh, teach more, um, and uh, realizing that we have a long way to go. And so I think um, we can never stop learning more and, um, and, and really pushing ourselves to just be better. Um, we have, especially in the field of sexual medicine, we have so much, so far to go in all of the things that we can do to help more people. So I think that's what drives me. Um, hearing you say that I am successful at the top of my field is always, you know, like, oh, hmm, hmm. So he thinks it's so. Maybe, maybe I'll start thinking it myself. So uh, I, you know, I, it's always funny to hear these things, but um, I, I, you know, social media has been so wonderful to get the word out and get sort of good information out there. So for anyone who wants to follow along, it's at Dr. Rachel Rubin, and I'm sure we'll post it um, and uh, happy to have you follow along and help any way that I can. Absolutely. I'm sure a lot of the guys will. It's been a, a great chat. Dr. Ruben, thank you again so much for your time and for your insights. And to all of you guys out there listening and watching, thank you for joining. And remember our mantra here at Better Man Clinics, your best life is a journey and not a destination. And use every single day to get just a little bit better. We'll uh, see you all next time.